Spare Room with Karen Terry. Hey y'all, and welcome to Spare Room. I'm Karen Terry, and today we're gonna to talk about designing playable characters. What we're talking about building here is the framework players can use to create characters in your role-playing game. So think about Dungeons and Dragons. What we're talking about here is the part of the player's handbook that goes over the different races, classes, and backgrounds you can choose for your character. Every role play, no matter how mundane, is going to need just a touch of this type of world building. This is because no matter what role play we're talking about, you're going to have to define what type of characters people can create in your role play. So how do we do this? The first thing is to think about the two types of players that might join your role play. One is the exact type of player that you want, whatever that is for your role play. So it's going to change depending on the role play and what style you're running it in. And the other type of player you'll need to think about is the type of player who's going to try to make the most extra, most bestest character and break your system in the process. How you define your characters must both cater to the type of player that you want and also mitigate the type of player who is seeking to break your system. This is a hard balance to pull off, but it's one that you can achieve. So keep this in the back of your mind as we go through some of these different things for designing the playable characters in your game. If you're doing a fandom roleplay, you have a few options. The first of which is to go ahead and pre-write bios that people can apply as. In addition to that, or sometimes instead of pre-written bios, you might also want to have parameters for which people can use to create their original characters for your roleplay. For example, if you're running a Marauders era Harry Potter roleplay, you might need players to choose whether they want to play an Order member, a Death Eater, or a neutral character. You might also want to provide advice, such as recommending people use surnames that are present in the canon of the books, or you might want to provide guidance on what you expect for original characters with more unique powers such as Animagus or Legomens. So when it comes to fandom roleplays, take some time to think about what you want to allow in relation to what is available in canon. As you're making these decisions, remember, everyone wants to feel special. So you can only limit the cool and unique things about the canon that you're pulling from for your roleplay by a certain amount until players will start to feel like it's unfair. So what about when it comes to running original games or non-fandom games, where everything is essentially designed by you and your mod team and maybe to some extent some of the players? How in those games do you design the type of characters that people are allowed to play in your game? First, have a solid idea for your plot. Your plot is going to drive how your world works and thus what type of characters make sense for your game. You want to provide choice, but not too much choice. For example, supernatural or monster role plays can be really fun, but if you allow anyone and everyone to create their own species, you're gonna end up with a world that doesn't really feel coherent and becomes kind of disjointed over time. You'll also find that in this situation, you might struggle to maintain the game as new players join and things slowly get more overpowered over time. So decide early on what types of characters people are allowed to create in your roleplay and make sure there's something for every type of player that you want to attract. Let me tell you an example about what I mean. In my current roleplay, all of the characters are witches. So all of the player characters are witches from this particular post-apocalyptic town. And to make sure my players have a choice, there are three types of witches you can pick from. So I'm gonna read you the first paragraph of the description of each kind. So the first one is a soul gem. A soul gem is created when a witch makes a contract with an Aetherborn. This is often done by lesser gods to bolster their ranks and create warriors that are expected to carry out their whims. When the contract is formed, the soul is reformed from the body and from then on inhabits a gem. If the soul gem is destroyed, the witch will become soul sick. In other parts of the lore book, soul sick is explained and also um, Aetherborns is what gods are called. That's the race that the gods belong to. So some context there. Okay, the next one is wild souls. A wild soul is a witch that is born not only with their own soul inside of them, but one of wild magic. 
the wild soul cannot be separated from their own, though it can occupy a different physical space in the form of an animal. The wild soul may change form to various animals until the witch reaches maturity. This happens at different times for each person, and during their teenage years, the soul will settle into its true form and can no longer shapeshift at will. Then last we have our soul scholars. Soul scholars receive their power through years of ardent study as children and teenagers. Soul gems that were never reformed back into bodies or wild souls that lost their witch are offered up to temples by the clans of these witches. These places are guarded by strong soldiers who keep watch over the artifacts and great tomes of knowledge. So if you think about how these three work together, soul gems are essentially warlocks with a patron, wild souls are essentially druid with an animal familiar, and soul scholars are essentially wizards who have to study and learn their magic. And if you want to read more about these, I would recommend joining my Discord server where I have more information on my roleplay and that will also, if you're interested in this roleplay, help you find it as well. That's going to become really outdated someday when this video is still up and that roleplay is closed. Um, so if that's the case, check the description. Um, I'll update it when that happens. So something to consider. Since this roleplay features magic, I know I'm going to attract min maxers. And so what that means is every type of witch that I've got in my roleplay has something that min maxers will like and also something that they won't. For example, Scholars have the most potential to be the most powerful type of witch. However, because their magic grows through study, the way to do this is to make a really old scholar that has spent most of their life studying magic and not really doing much else. And most role players, the truth is, they want to make a character that's in their 20s. So they're not going to be happy making an older character, even if making the character like, you know, 50 or 60 years old means they might be super powerful. Gems, on the other hand, get their power instantly when they make that contract with the Aetherborn. However, they only get one power, and that's all they really get ever. Any growth that they might have is incredibly slow and unlikely to happen within the scope of the roleplay. And the truth is we don't really get min-maxers that apply as wild souls. Those characters typically tend to be taken by people who are interested in a more um, utility sort of role for their character. So now that we've gone through that example, let's talk about applications for a little bit. So if you remember back to my applications video, and I'll, I'll make sure that that's linked up in the card, we talked a little bit about additional questions that you might find on the application. Those additional questions should be based on the character part of your lore book. So for example, in this role play, I have them pick which type of witch their character is, and then based off of what they pick, there are additional questions where they're prompted to describe certain things about the witch's powers. So what else might you design that characters need to choose? If you're doing a warring faction style role play, such as like a kingdom versus kingdom or a mob role play or something like that, you're going to need to have descriptions for the different factions in your lore book, and people are going to need to choose on their application which faction their character belongs to. I also recommend for almost every role play, especially town and city role plays, to have characters pick a job. This helps players understand what their character is supposed to do in the role play. Even in my current witchy RP that's revolving around magic a lot of the times, I still have characters pick a job or a role for their character that's what they do inside the town that they live. Honestly, the only role plays I've ever run where I don't have people pick some kind of job or role like this is school role plays. And that's really just because it's unique to schools and, and there are legitimately characters that will be just students and really nothing else. But basically every other role play I run, I have the characters pick some kind of job or role. That's how helpful this is in regard to helping people create goals for their characters and really get them involved in the role play. Um, another time actually that I don't do this is in Dungeons and Dragons, and that's because in Dungeons and Dragons, every character kind of has the same job, which is adventurer. But then in D&D, they have to pick a class, so that kind of fills that need. Another thing you could try is if you're running a more modern roleplay, is have your players create their characters based off of something. 
This will help ensure that people create a variety of characters and you don't end up with the same type of character over and over. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is having people base their characters off of like a zodiac sign or a color or MBTI or any other type of symbol that you can create a list of. And then what you can do is once that particular thing on the list is taken, it's struck out and no one can use it as their inspiration anymore and they have to pick something else on the list. If you run modern slice of lifestyle role plays, I recommend this method as a good way to kind of accomplish this and give people something to base their character off of. Also, I'm gonna link my um, symbolism video up in the card because basically everything I talk about there could potentially be used for this style of role play. So in conclusion, when designing this part of your lore book, make sure there's something there for every type of player you want to attract and that you also take some time to think about trying to mitigate things for min-maxers or players that you really don't want to attract. And of course, make sure that your application process is appropriate to what's in your lore book so that you end up with characters where you know that they read and understood that part of the lore. So what other tips do you guys use when doing your character design for your lore books for your roleplay? Let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching to the end of the video. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell if you want to help my channel grow. If you'd like to support me, link to my Patreon is in the description, as well as my Amazon page to buy my book. Right here is where the names of my $5 and up patrons will go starting in November. And don't forget to make it a great day.